think it's very important that um, we design architecture for people and really paying attention to the people that the architecture is for. is Tosio Oshino. I am an architect um, and I have a practice in Lagos, Nigeria called CM Design Atelier. What is your aim in choosing the beauty of impermanence and architecture for adaptability as the theme for Sharjah Triennial 2023? What is the message that you're trying to convey? So I think the, the beauty of impermanence and architecture for adaptability really is a combination of all the experiences that have made me a practitioner today. Um, growing up in a, a developing city, um, being exposed, going to the UK for university, coming back home to practice and understanding that, you know, things that I had learned in the global north were very different from the situations I was finding in the global south and being able to bridge the gap and understand myself within that. So the, the theme really is looking at the innovations that exist predominantly in the global south. Um, innovations that involve uh, waste reuse, um, working with climate rather than against it, innovations in this in design that exist that that allow us to create adaptable solutions that that fundamentally can deal with a lot of the challenges that we have globally, because these have been innovations and solutions that have existed in these locations for centuries, that haven't necessarily been celebrated or acknowledged by the canon as viable solutions but if you really look at them in their content and context they really do they really do address some of the fundamental challenges we're facing today and i strongly believe that if we are able to to look at those solutions and start to think about the scalability of them that we really could address some of our challenges with climate change so now, um, like while addressing the historic perception of the South and trying to bring forth a newfound identity for the region, what or who are your inspirations? Wow. Um, to be honest, uh, I've been inspired by a lot of the work that was done in the 50s and 60s by the early modernist architects. Um, I find myself questioning some of their principles today, but I'll be honest, they were very early inspirations. Uh, the Friar Otto's, you know, the uh, Friar Otto, Max, Maxwell Fry, you know, these were the, the early modernists who came into, you know, the, the emerging economies and created an architecture that was working with passive systems of ventilation and light, even though they were using a material that was foreign, being con, con Creed. But because there was a very conscious effort to, to work within a, within a climatic condition, um, that really has inspired a lot of the practice that I do today. And um, being able to, to take examples from that period, married with a lot more traditional systems, I, I really feel that that's where my work has been honed. Uh, more contemporary inspirations, I would say, would be you know, would be Francis Carey. And I think Francis Carey particularly because he's been able to very eloquently translate uh, and, and create a, um, a more contemporary uh, approach to, to what was being done in the 50s and 60s with the early modernist architects. And he hasn't stuck with the, the material of the time, which was concrete, you know, he's gone back into now experimenting with contextual materials from locations in association with concrete, but also still working with passive systems to create comfortable environments within these regions. Yeah. So now uh, you have mentioned that you've always felt a tension between what you understand as principles of architecture and what you've encountered while growing up in Nigeria. So how did the local architecture and culture influence your sense of belongingness? Uh, and this is a really interesting question because, and I and I'm not sure how it is in India, but I think, particularly for the continent of Africa, we we kind of got propelled into an urban state. You had a lot of rural settlements. We had a burst of, I guess, industrialization. Well, 
not industrialization modernism because we never really were industrialized <laughs> you know our materials were extracted and taken to industrialize other regions but in terms of population increase you had a lot of people who moved from rural locations to urban locations in a very short period of time and a lot of the contextual building solutions that had existed didn't scale well with this mass increase and because of colonization and imported technologies that came we had new forms of buildings that formed roots so you could say that our traditional materials and representations of buildings didn't translate into a modern context so i found myself questioning on many levels what an african building is and how i identify with it because what i consider as truly african is something that no longer works within a modern context it would have been the traditional building that would have been in a rural or village-like settlement with probably an argon economy around it, which is very different from how we live today. And when I relate it to the question, it's important to me to find ways of identifying my culture within my buildings. But it cannot be a direct kind of imposition of the way things were done before. And I feel that there is a generation now of practitioners who are very conscious and aware of this idea of identity. And by re-looking and exploring the technologies and the materials that exist uh, locally and working in a more research development uh, methodology, trying to see how we can marry the new with the old to start to create some kind of identity moving forward. Because prior, honestly, it didn't exist. I didn't grow up in a traditional setting. The most traditional is a building that was built in the 50s and 60s, you know, but that really in itself is, is, is a modern day construct. And I think a lot of people from the continent kind of struggle with this. And again, when you think about it, uh, all these uh, different groups of people have been brought together and we've, been, we've had a nation state created around us. There are many different ethnicities, many different languages spoken within Nigeria. I think we have um, over 500, you know, if you start to break it down to dialects, um, and all these different regions and locations, apart from different clothing, different dress, you know, different culture, there would have been different buildings as well, depending on the, re the region, the, the, the climate, the materials available. So there's so much diversity. How do we create this kind of inclusivity? And that was what the architecture of modernism allowed. It allowed us to create an identity of the nation state and a language or an aesthetic that everyone could resonate with because it didn't resonate with anyone to start with. It was a blank canvas for us all to work from. But this yearning for identity has to be more than, than nationalism, has to be more than modernism. And to bring that back, we now need to go back and to relook at the materials that are available to us locally and now use those incorporating with, the, incorporating with our architecture. And I think this is what Kerry has done very well. Uh, thank you for that. It actually does um, bring me to a question about, I think, just <clears throat> a little bit about colonization and this kind of whole, not whole, but a, a shift uh, from, as you said, this more traditional and historic architecture to this break uh, where that line of our, that uh, typology of architecture wasn't allowed to develop on its own into yes. an urban architecture. Because, I mean, if we look at urban architecture right now, it has this, you know, which I'm sure when you went to the UK, you studied the genealogy of how it comes about. And perhaps this traditional architecture actually hasn't had the opportunity. It to, hasn't, yes. Uh, to grow into that. Yeah, I can visualize a movie from this. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> no, but it's it's so fascinating. And it's so, I mean, I, I, I hate to give this example, but, you know, when you watch all these Marvel movies like Wakanda, it, it just makes you realize that if, if, if you allow this kind of island evolution of, of a typology to have developed with the changing needs of the people and the densification, we could have had a very different representation of what we have today within our modern cities for all these different regions. So, you know, it's, um, I mean, it's poetic, it's a nice to think what if, you know, but in reality, very much so, you would have worked with what was available and you would have developed those technologies to ensure that they worked with the changing times and the densification that has happened for all of us all around the world. 
Yeah. So, no, uh, like you were just mentioning how the whole representation happens in movies and everything. So that brings me to the question that cultural appropriation and represent representing Nigerian culture, people, and life in movies, art, media, and fashion is definitely a major concern. So, do you think that this is prevalent in the architectural circuit as well? I think it's coming now, and I think I guess the nature of architecture with well funny enough we're, we're talking about impermanence but the permanence of a building it's a lot uh i guess the trajectory to show this identity has been a lot slower i think uh from the from the mid noughties there there really has been a bubbling of creativity from cities like lagos and across nigeria at least globally now we've heard of nollywood you know we have nigerian artists winning grammy awards we have nigerian fashion designers who are being seen and respected on the international scene you know um and it's going across for literature as well in film even on netflix you do have a lot of representation from nigeria now and and i think um even for the visual arts the visual arts are very well respected here um they've had a lot of interest internationally with buyers coming in we're having artist work which have been um taken by museums you know so there's there's a lot coming out culturally but i guess for building itself because of the nature of cost and time required this ripple we're seeing much slower but i i believe it's coming there are quite a lot of practitioners now who are very actively involved in contextualizing the aesthetic here locally you know we you still will get clients who say they want the florida house or they want the house to look like an image you've seen internationally but as the as the language as the aesthetic is evolving we're also beginning to see clients beginning to request it there's a more there's much more of a discerning requirement to create an architecture that is unique that is local that is bespoke that is about identity is a, that is about a, ce- a celebration of culture but i do believe it's still very much in its infancy but it's coming so uh, now while the region moves into a new realm of finding its own distinct and architectural style how important is it for the style to remain humanitarian and sustainable because i know you have talk a lot about the regional conflicts and the rights that's been happening locally and how that's influencing the community and the built environment that's coming up there so in the light of those regional conflicts and other factors affecting how important do you think the upcoming architecture have to be rooted in humanitarian principles i think it's i think it's i think it's pretty important and i know you're relating this with um the project that i recently f- completed in borno which was um a resettlement town for people who have been disgraced by the that have been displaced by the insurgency boko haram i think it's very important that um we design architecture for people and really paying attention to the people that the architecture is for in the context of that project it was really really important to understand their spatial requirements it's um there are many solutions in housing there are many solutions for space but it's important that we understand the cultural context in which we're working so for example on that project um they are not uh, the community are not used to using a wc toilet a water closet who are we culturally to come and impose a system you know it's it's the, the women in the in the idp camps when i went to see them and to understand how they lived they have a culture of cooking outside who am i to give them a kitchen they don't need it <laughs> you know and i think um you know sometimes when we think about the modern world we think about it being progressive what really is progress who measures this if if people need a certain type of housing because of how they live our job as designers is to ensure we provide that appropriately and make it as comfortable and conducive as their needs require but not to impose a system that isn't um their norm and i think it's it's important that we as designers are respectful to understand that there is so much diversity in how people use space you know it's it's very different when you're thinking of an institutional building or a public building but the minute that you get down to the housing unit it's important to understand the cultural context in which you would provide and particularly for that project there was a big requirement for passive systems there is um it's an area that is outside of the city outside of the town 
you know, to be able to create comfortable uh, spaces because we were using uh, modern building materials, which are also will also increase the heat retention within the building. How can we incorporate cross ventilation and deep shaded corridors to ensure that we keep the spaces comfortable for the inhabitants? These are all the elements that as designers we need to pay attention to because long after we leave the project, there is the occupation period. And that's really the test of if we provided the solutions that work. So uh, now, as you've earlier mentioned that um, in African Union, there are multiple countries and multiple languages being spoken. So yeah. uh, post-independence, most colonized countries revived and directly moved to a world that's ruled by globalization rather than reconnecting with their roots. So how has this affected the way that you perceive architecture for the community, the way you design and the types of projects that you create? The reality is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Africa is a, a construct of the Berlin Conference. But there was a conference in Berlin and it was just decided by European states and they literally just carved the continent out. France took a bit. Um, Britain took a bit, you know, Germany took a bit, you know, Italy took a bit. And those lines have been what have eventually formed country boundaries at the turn of, of independence. The reality is that all these locations had many, many, many different ethnicities. And in many situations, even in Nigeria, you had the northern ethnic groups and the southern. And very well did you have crossing because of the land mass and the terrain between them which was broken obviously with the addition of the railroad which allowed for movement back and forth but when you work across this level of diversity you can hardly think that it's possible to have a single language you know the one thing they gave us was a language that would allow us all to communicate together we have many facets of that we have many different pigeon pigeon or you could almost call it like a creole english across the different regions that most people will understand but language gave us a very much needed unifying factor across board. Now, how that relates um, with uh, how people connect to their roots, most people still have a very strong affiliation with their local culture, as I do. I'm Yoruba. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, going back to this idea of identity and culture, we really are just beginning to get back to a point or an acknowledgement that we need to find a way to represent our cultures within our building spaces. Um, when you colonize a people, apart from changing their religion, their ways of, of living, there's a lot that is lost. There's a lot of information about cultures that can be lost in the process of being progressive and taking on other cultures. We've been very fortunate that certain aspects have been allowed to continue our food, our fashion, our respect for our elders, the way we interact with each other. But architecture has kind of fallen slightly. And I guess it's because of how it's developed. Like I mentioned, there's a generation of practitioners who have, have gotten to a point where there's a celebration of identity now. And I think that really has been, or is the starting point for how it will come across in our architecture. I honestly think that if we look back at this period in another 20, 30 years, these kind of languages, these aesthetics will be very clearly formed and we'll be having a conversation in retrospect of this is the architecture of, of this particular region in Africa or of this ethnicity, whether it will be a national or whether it will be um, uh, based on ethnicity, I guess that's still to be seen, but there will be very much a consciousness of identity within these regions across the aesthetics. That actually brings us to one of your projects, which was the um, the creating a community for displaced uh, peoples in Nigeria. Yes. Uh, it has a sensitivity to it uh, in its program itself. Uh, so what were some of the challenges you faced while uh, rebuilding or building uh, that project actually? It was, um, to be honest, it's, it's the most humbling work I've ever done. I think as a designer, you know, a lot of architects, well, I can say for Nigeria, will work in private practice. You work with a client, you are a designer, they give you a brief, you produce a beautiful home or a corporate space. 
but here I was working with a community who technically were not the client, but were the end users. And understanding the many stakeholders that would be involved from the government to the United Nations, to the community themselves, and making sure everybody was happy. Um, it was very important to me as a designer that I would create spaces that are comfortable for them, not only from what they told me, but from what I observed from them. And I remember going up there and walking around, asking to see some existing traditional buildings, asking to speak to somebody within cultural, the cultural space about how the culture of the people, the Islamic culture, the Kunari culture, how to create spaces that would be conducive for the women to have privacy in the home, making sure that lines of sight for a male visitor are not visible into the compound, working to try and see how I could incorporate some kind of iconography from the beautiful cultural patterns I found from the Bam Bam caps into the architecture, but not as necessarily a literal translation. I guess the biggest challenge was just balancing all these different elements. I was really coming in as an outsider. I'm from the South in Nigeria. I had never been to the North of Nigeria before. So this was a journey of discovery and I approached it with a very open and neutral mind. I was going in to understand the cultural context and I wanted to, I wanted to celebrate it. I wanted them to be proud of where they're from and to create some kind of, um, environment that will help them to rebuild back their lives in, 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 a, in, a, in a proud in a proud way you know they should be proud of their homes they should be house proud but um it was challenging as a woman because again going up in that context uh you know i think for a lot of the community there was a little bit of surprise to see that it was a a, a lady who was the designer for, for this development it was interesting as well that when I would speak with the community that um, you would converse with the men first and then you would converse with the women separately. Um, what made it not so challenging was the fact that because it was commissioned by the UN, I came with an umbrella of authority. So I didn't have as much, there was no conflict. There was no, we're not doing, we don't want this. You know, Everybody was very happy to work with me and, and, and that was great. It was quite challenging, the distances. It's um, technically only a two hour plane drive, but you have to stop over in the middle belt in Abuja and the flight could be delayed for three hours. So it could take a whole day of travel to get there, to go for a meeting that was under a lot of security because um, you know during the construction period, it wasn't a, um, a very lived in area. And so it was very important as you're going with the UN escort, you go with the military escort as well. So we're only allowed to be on site for two, three hours at a time, you know, for the inspection. So it's like a day of travel to get there, two, three hours on site, another day of travel back. <laughs> so, I mean, but it's, um, it was a real labor of love. And I remember there was a day I went to see the community because I spent quite a lot of time with them back and forth interaction to tell them that the project was starting on site and the way they clapped for me i was like wow you know it's it, it's so fulfilling when you know that um the labor of your hands or your you, you contribute so positively beyond the value of the fee that you're paid but that you could potentially create or be part of helping somebody to have a stable home that you never know which child is going to grow up in this location and do great things to know that that ripple effect of goodwill can continue much further than the impact of, of your service, I think has been the most fulfilling thing for me from this experience. And I say this because I've been very fortunate to work at the other extreme for a private client with a very, very beautiful high end home, but to use the same skills, to answer the questions as a designer, do I create a comfortable place for people to occupy? Will this person be happy in this space? Will they be able to nurture family and friends? You know, always thinking about people, humanity. And I think as designers in our everyday lives, if we are conscious of this as a, as a, singular, as a singular point of value add, I think we do a better job in providing the solutions that we do. 
Yeah. So like that brings me to our next question that how do you think the new developing architectures architectural style of the global south would take shape in the near future what's your vision for this architecture that's being built I think we need to I think we've all gone in the direction of of a global modernism post modernism um but I do think that where we are now we need to move a little bit back towards contextual modernism now working with materials from location um i highly doubt that we'll ever get rid of concrete <laughs> um but i do think that we should more consciously imbibe an idea of co- contextuality more regional work work that re- that that works with with the environment of location that works with materials that are available from there and and in a way try and recreate the diversity that we would have had that we've kind of lost in the last 400 years so like when you're mentioning both these things and you've already uh, talked about how you worked in a whole range of pro- projects that vary from community development to luxury uh, projects for clients so um, besides working on humanitarian projects the residential and commercial projects you have worked such as coral pavilion and everything so how do you transition between varying typologies and requirement and the clientele <laughs> I think to be honest <laughs> maybe this is the one question I can't answer directly because I think everything has fed off each other what's great about the curatorial ship is it's helped me to refine my ideas about who I am as a designer and what I present to the world and finding people who resonate along that theme those thoughts are feeding back to my practice and I'm becoming a lot more um positioned in my opinions about the kind of architecture I want to create and how I go about it to so when I do furniture that I get to use another part of my mind which is giving me a flexibility of color and pattern that the permanence of a building I I need to think respectfully that this building needs to be here for a period of time how do I create um a building more as a canvas as opposed to an object of display you know but I think um it's it's given me a level of balance and it's given me the opportunity to evolve as a designer as I go because every time i delve into one sector and refine and i come out it influences the next and it's giving me this really great opportunity that i'm so happy to have and i really think that for all of us as architects it's important to step in and step out on a regular basis to help us to review our positioning you know every project should be an opportunity to grow to reflect go back and look and see what decisions made worked what will i evolve what will i change you know and then also the importance of theory and thinking and writing and ensuring that one is constantly questioning why we do what we do and how we do it um so i guess in answer it gives me balance you know i'm it juggling a lot of pieces but they're all informing you know different aspects of my practice Okay. So now to our last question. What's next for Toshino Shino? <laughs> I guess to be honest, at this stage I'm just trying to get over the hurdle of the triennial. It's um it's it is an amazing experience curating this, all the people that I'm meeting. Um I think really it's to watch this space for November and then take a pause and then maybe another direction. but a lot happening in the near future <laughs>